Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today we're going to take a quick look at a kit I use to teach basic motor controls. An orientation to and inspection of this kit's contents serves as great practical exercise to accompany the contactors, control relays, overloads, and switches in electrically controlled systems lectures, all available at the Big Bad Tech channel. This kit is meant to accompany the motor control trainer board, another tool I frequently use when teaching basic motor control. While not every circuit I discuss in this lecture series can be constructed using this kit and board, the collection of components represents a base state from which many common practical circuits can be built without a tremendous financial commitment to you or your organization. The kit includes common devices that can be repurposed or used in alternative configurations to simulate other more expensive devices. Should you feel it necessary, there is nothing stopping you from adding or subtracting items to your own personal kit. Should you wish to replicate this kit in whole or in part, note that I've included part numbers in the information section associated with this video. Before we begin our tour, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Caithness Energy for making this possible. Caithness Energy developed, constructed, and currently manages and operates the Caithness Shepherd's Flats wind farm just outside of Arlington, Oregon. Shepherd's Flats is one of the world's largest wind farms and generates enough clean renewable energy to power hundreds of thousands of homes and delivers millions of dollars in revenue to the state of Oregon. Caithness Energy recognizes that rural wind farm investments have the power to generate not just clean energy, but also full-time jobs. For this reason, Caithness Energy made a 10-year, $250,000 financial commitment to Columbia Gorge Community College in the Dallas, Oregon. These funds provide scholarships to students in the Renewable Energy Technology Program, and go towards updating this program to ensure students continually receive relevant hands-on training using modern technology. My sincere thanks go to Caithness Energy for their commitment to this region and its citizens. The themes for the Motor Control Trainer Kit are flexibility, expandability, practicality, and hands-on exposure to wiring real components. Basic introductory labs might only use one or two devices. However, as a student progresses through the Motor Control course, the idea is to build upon the base concepts and continually expand both the flexibility and complexity of the assigned circuits. Students gain practical hands-on wiring experience and afforded numerous opportunities for troubleshooting, doubly so if you work with an especially dull lab partner. Note this lecture is a brief tour and overview only, a thorough inspection of each component, functions test, and review of the associated data sheets should accompany a hands-on lab exercise. Later lectures and application exercises will examine these devices in greater detail. The kit contains one manual motor starter, three three-pole contactors, three auxiliary contact blocks, two overload relays, one maintained contact three-position selector switch, one maintained contact e-stop switch, three momentary contact push buttons in three different colors, red, green, and yellow, three pilot lamp indicators in three different colors, red, green, and yellow, one eight pin control relay and base. Additionally, it includes a handful of accessory contact blocks, a mechanical interlock for paired contactors, and a pre-configured set of wires used for reversing motor starters. Finally, you may wish to consider the addition of a basic multifunction timer, a motor drive, and quite possibly a basic PLC. More on these options before I bring this lecture to a close. A word about specifications before we continue. Most of the pilot devices in this kit are rated exclusively for 120 volts AC. If you choose to adopt 24 volt DC pilot level voltage, you must find an appropriately rated device as well as a 24 volt DC pilot power supply. Additionally, the devices in this kit are intended to make and break connection to light industrial three phase 60 Hertz AC characterized by 120 volt line to neutral voltage and 208 volt line to line voltage. Ordinarily, the motor employed for these exercises will at most be 200 watts. If you choose to switch greater or lesser primary voltage or a more or less powerful motor, you must use appropriately rated devices. Let's start by examining the manual motor starter. The manual motor starter is a three pole contactor and overload element integrated into a single package. The contacts directly make or break connection to primary voltage based upon the actuation state of the rotary dial in the front. The integrated overload elements protect the motor from sustained overload conditions. Additionally, 
This manual motor starter also serves to protect the circuit from high current events associated with short circuits and acts just like a circuit breaker. The manual motor starter features an adjustable dial on the front used to adjust the overload current setting. The manual motor starter can be used to directly start a motor or it can be used to functionally isolate pilot and primary voltages for test and troubleshooting purposes, as we'll learn in later lectures. Let's now take a look at the three pole contactors. Contactors make or break connection to a primary voltage based upon the activation state of the pilot level coil. Each three pole contactor has a coil from terminals A1 to A2 and three normally open primary contacts, L1 to T1, L2 to T2, L3 to T3. When the coil is energized by pilot level voltage or if the manual override is triggered, the primary contacts close. These contactors additionally feature a normally open auxiliary contact from terminals 1-3 to 1-4 rated for pilot voltage. This auxiliary contact can be used for holding and feedback purposes as we'll learn in later lectures. The auxiliary contact blocks are a collection of additional pilot level contacts that attach to the front of an ordinary contactor. When the contactor coil is energized, the mechanically interlocked auxiliary contact blocks contacts also change states. These particular auxiliary contact blocks offer two normally open and two normally closed contacts. These additional pilot level contacts offer enhanced functionality and can be used for electrical interlock purposes as we'll learn in later lectures. Let's now take a look at the overload relays. The overload relays are designed such that they link with the contactor forming a compact motor starter. The overload features primary connections L1 to T1, L2 to T2, and L3 to T3. The overload features two pilot level auxiliary contacts in the front, a normally closed contact from 95 to 96, and a normally open contact from 97 to 98. When the overload elements detect sustained current draw in excess of the adjustable set point, these pilot level contacts change states. The overload features a reset mode selector on the left hand side and an adjustable overload setting on the right hand side. The reset selector has four modes, auto, auto with external test, hand with external test, and hand. Those settings with an external test allow a technician to trigger the overload by manually pressing the test button in the front of the overload. Those settings without an external test disable the manual test button in the front of the overload. Automatic resets will automatically reset the pilot level contacts after the overload elements have been given a chance to cool. A hand or manual reset requires an operator to acknowledge the overload condition and manually reset it after an overload has occurred. Let's now take a look at some of the switches and indicators, starting with the maintain contact three position selector switch. This particular manufacturer ships this switch with four associated contact blocks, two of which are normally closed in red and two of which are normally open in green. Let's assemble the three position selector switch such that two normally closed contact blocks go on top close to the actuator and two normally open green contact blocks go on the bottom. Let's call the switches on the left one and two and the switches on the right three and four. Given the first switch is normally closed by nature, the terminals would be assigned one one and one two. Given the second switch on the bottom is normally open by nature, the terminals would be assigned 2-3 and 2-4. Given the third switch is normally closed by nature, the terminals would be assigned 3-1 and 3-2. Finally, given the fourth switch is normally open by nature, the terminals would be assigned 4-3 and 4-4. A schematic symbol can be used to illustrate the function of the selector switch in its various positions. However, given this many switches activated by a single actuator, a contact chart or target table illustrates this functionality more compactly. The target table indicates that when the switch is in the center off position, all switches are in their deactivated state. 1-1 one, one to 1-2 one, is closed, 2-3 two, to 2-4 two, is open, 3-1 to 3-2 is closed, and 4-3 to 4-4 four, four is open. The target table indicates that when the selector switch is in the left position, only the first and second switch on the left hand side are in their activated states and the third and fourth switches on the right hand side remain in their deactivated states. 1-1 one, one to 1-2 has been opened. 
23224 has been closed, 31232 remains closed, and 43244 remain open. The target table indicates that when the selector switch is in the right position, only the third and fourth switches on the right-hand side are in their activated states, and the first and second switches on the left-hand side remain in their deactivated states. 11212 remains closed, 23224 remains open, 31232 has been opened, 43244 has been closed. Importantly, this three-position selector switch is maintained contact, meaning that when placed in the left, center, or right position, it does not return to a deactivated state until an operator actively moves the switch into a new position. Let's now take a look at the Maintain Contact E-Stop button. This particular manufacturer ships the e-stop with one set of red normally closed contacts. Let's add another set of normally closed accessory contact blocks. Let's consider the normally closed switch on the left, the first switch, and the normally closed switch on the right, the second switch. Therefore, our terminal numbers would be 11 and 12 for the first switch, and 21 and 22 for the second switch. Note while these switches are electrically isolated from one another, the schematic symbol shows that they are mechanically interlocked together. When an operator presses the e-stop, both contacts would open. Being maintained in nature, when an operator releases the e-stop, the contacts remain in the activated open state. Only when an operator resets the e-stop by twisting it and pulling it do they return to their deactivated closed state. Let's now take a look at the momentary contact push buttons. This particular manufacturer ships the red push button with one set of red normally closed contacts and the green and yellow push buttons with one set of green normally open contacts. Let's add some additional accessory contact blocks such that each push button now includes one set of red normally closed contacts and one set of green normally open contacts. Let's consider the normally closed switch, the first switch, and the normally open switch, the second switch. Therefore, our terminal numbers should be 11 and 12 for the normally closed side and 23 and 24 for the normally open side. Note while these paired switches are electrically isolated from one another, the schematic symbol shows that they are mechanically interlocked together. When an operator presses the single button, the normally closed side opens and the normally open side closes. Being momentary in nature, when an operator releases the button, the contacts will return to their deactivated state. When assembled in this fashion, you'll note the only thing that differentiates one push button from another is the color of the button. At risk of insulting your intelligence, it would be negligent of me to not remind you that all of society customarily assumes red means stop and green means go. This being said, there is absolutely nothing preventing you from wiring a circuit such that the stop button is green and the go button is red. You can wear a hat on your foot but that is not its intended purpose. Don't be the person that makes me jump out of the internet and throttle you for violating long-held conventions of an ordered society. Red is stop, green is go. Let's now take a look at the three pilot lamp indicators in three different colors, red, green, and yellow. When energized by pilot level voltage, these indicators illuminate their respective colors and are often used to indicate the state of a system as well as for test and troubleshooting purposes. Let's now take a look at the 8-pin control relay and base. This control relay includes a coil between terminals A1 and A2 and two single-pole double-throw transfer contacts. The first switch's terminals are 1-1 for the common, 1-2 for the normally closed side, and 1-4 for the normally open side. The second switch's terminals are 2-1 for the common, 2-2 for the normally closed side, and 2-4 for the normally open side. When the coil is energized by pilot level voltage, these associated contacts change states. The normally closed side would open and the normally open side would close. When the coil is de-energized, these associated contacts would return to their deactivated state. These pilot level contacts can be used to energize and de-energize other electrical loads inside a pilot level ladder logic diagram based upon the activation state of the coil. Executing a functions check and coordinating the pins of the ice cube relay with the terminals on the base may take some time and consideration on your part during later applications exercises. Finally, the basic motor control kit includes some accessory devices used when pairing contactors used in a forward and reversing motor starter, notably a mechanical interlock 
that prevents the physical movement of one contactor's contact carrier when the other has been pulled into the activated position, and a set of pre-wired connectors that selectively swap applied phase sequence. We'll be making use of these handy devices in later lectures on magnetic reversing motor starters. All these components neatly fit into a locking tackle box suitable for storage. A lab group has issued the kit at the beginning of the class, conducts an inventory and basic inspection and functions test of each component, and then gets to work building practical motor control circuits. Each lab period, a lab group will be expected to build increasingly complex circuits, making use of more and more devices. At the end of the quarter, the motor control board is disassembled and the kit re-inventoried and passed on to the next lab group. Before we bring this lecture to a close, let's discuss customizing your particular kit and bringing some bling to your lab. No basic motor control course is complete without a discussion of timers. Timers are often a matter of personal preference and no one timer is better than another. This being said, I recommend getting a basic multifunction timer that at a minimum executes the following functions. On delay, off delay, on and off delay, rising or falling edge one shots, the flash or recycle function, and finally the cumulative on delay function. Additionally, there exist multifunction timer relays that also execute counter functions. We'll examine the many different applications of timers and counters in later lectures. Moving on, the motor control kit need not be limited to electromechanical devices, but could also include solid state components like soft starters and or a motor drive. We'll examine both these devices in later lectures, and no motor control course is complete without a discussion of these amazingly adaptable devices. Finally, where does the discussion of traditional relay-based ladder logic motor control end and a discussion of advanced programmable logic controllers, PLCs, begin? The answer is it doesn't, but rather these closely related topics are a continuum that should seamlessly blend from one topic into the other. For this reason, I highly recommend an early discussion of PLCs to be included in a motor control course as soon as possible. This being said, not the most advanced PLC is required for basic introductory topics, but rather a range of inexpensive basic PLCs exist that serve these preparatory needs quite nicely. Tico manufactures the inexpensive SG2 PLR, Programmable Logic Relay, and offers free, fully functional software. The simulation utility is not the most robust, but hey, it's free. Eaton offers the Easy Intelligent Relay family and offers a free demonstration version of the software. The simulation utility is excellent, but to download a program to an actual device, you need to purchase the fully functional software. You can't have it all. Thorough discussion of more advanced PLC applications should include a range of devices and not limit discussion to a single manufacturer or programming software. In this spirit, Later lectures on PLCs will make use of a range of devices to execute common industrial functions. All right, that about wraps it up for this brief introduction to the Motor Control Trainer Kit. This base configuration in conjunction with a Motor Control Trainer Board, motor, and any bling you like to add like motor drives and basic PLCs can be used to create a number of common industrial circuits for your edification and enlightenment. No, it doesn't do everything, but it will keep you entertained for a long, long, long time. If you wish to replicate this kit for your purposes, you are more than welcome to do so. Part numbers appear in the information section of this video. Later application exercises and lectures will make use of the items in this kit to test and troubleshoot some common circuits. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.